Did you know that women over 55 are the highest growing cohort of homeless in this country? And one recent study suggested only 25% of property investments are owned by women. Shockingly, a third of Australian women retire with no super and the rest are likely to end up with much less money in their retirement kitty compared to their male counterparts. Why is this so? And what role does home ownership play in the solution? Welcome to your first home buyer guide, the podcast for first home buyers who want to get it right. I'm Megan and that was Veronica. We're both buyers agents and probably old enough to be your mums. But that's a good thing because between us, we've got over 40 years experience and we are going to share with you bucket loads of stories about avoidable mistakes. Together, we're going to make sure that you get unbiased and real information that you can rely on so you can get where you want to be without missing a step. Now, we've got loads of great tips for you in this episode. And if you'd like more useful tools, head over to the website, homebuyeracademy.com.au. There you'll find free checklists that you can download, a free mini course on how to price a property and our where to buy a workshop for only $39. Priceless stuff, really. Bargain. But before we get into the interesting stuff in this week's episode, here's the boring bit, the disclaimer. You of course know that nothing in this podcast is to be taken as personal advice. We always recommend getting the advice of an expert in their field of expertise. Now we've done our very best to ensure that the content is correct at the time of recording, but things change. So check with the relevant government authority or your advisors to get the most up-to-date information. And so we've invited Nicola McDougall to come and talk to us about this very important issue for a lot of reasons, but namely because she's written a book very recently on this or co-wrote a book on this. Do you want to introduce that, Megan? Yeah, look, this is awesome. This book is fantastic. It's called The Female Investor, which is all about being clued up, taking charge and being proactive with your finances via strategic property investment at any age. This is the book that will help you establish financial security and stand on your own two feet, no matter what life may throw at you. And Veronica, we've had a lot thrown at us in our lives. We have indeed. And (laughs) welcome, Nicola. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you, ladies. It is so fantastic to see you both on this of all days. We are recording this on International Women's Day. I know. How cool is that? I am so happy that we're chatting on International Women's Day. I was going to make a little confession is that we're really shit at scheduling our episodes to line up properly. So instead of actually having... We're going to get on to that. Yeah. Instead of having this released on on International Women's Day, we're we're recording it on International Women's Day. Well, but you know what though? It actually keeps the conversation going because there's obviously a lot of um, content out there today. Some of it great. Some of it, um, you know, a little bit just, oh, it's International Women's Day. We should say something. Whereas... This, you know, I think it's actually probably good that the narrative continues, not just on one day of the year. No, I'm 100% with you on that. If you remember when we interviewed Sarah Megginson from Finder, we interviewed her about um, cybersecurity and, and we were spurred on by, is it cybersecurity month or something, or week or whatever, and we went, oh, that's a good topic. Let's interview someone. And a month or two later, we're still talking about it. So that's a very good point. Now, congratulations on the book as well, and you know we really and you won an award too, so we we know that it's uh, it's getting some reach. So that's fantastic. Um, one of the things about, uh, I guess, you know, there's a, there's a bit out there at the moment. A lot of people talking about you know women's financial literacy and the, the need for women to step up and own our own finances and investing and owning our home and and all of those sorts of things. And certainly Megan and I talk often about the fact that we're both now old enough to be a lot of our listeners, mum, but we wouldn't be in the position we are now financially had we not bought property earlier on in life and made, we made mistakes, but we also made a lot of good decisions. So, you know, we are poster children for, and I think you're a bit the same, Nicola, but I mean, can you sum up for us where we're really up to with women's finances in this country? Because, you know, I've read out a couple of stats earlier on. They're not looking as good as the three of us might suggest. No, and that's right. And, you know, when we talk about the gender pay gap, which, you know, continues to to really stubbornly not change that much. And it's important to understand when we talk about the gender pay gap, 
it's not about women getting paid less than men um, for the same jobs. You know, it's not necessarily about that. I'm not saying that that sometimes that that, that doesn't happen. Certainly does exist. Yes, it does but exist. But it's a bigger problem than that. Yeah, but the problem is, well, not the, is it a problem? It's just the differences between males and females throughout their working lives. And generally that, you know, women take time out of the workforce uh, because they've had children. Um, they might return to work um, in a lower paid position in the same company, for example, um, or they may not return to work at all. They probably might return to work in a part-time capacity. So over the course of their lifetimes, their total earnings are far inferior to, to a man's. And that's, I doubt that's going to change very much at all. If we're talking about the total lifetime earnings of somebody uh, in your job, uh, whether you're self-employed or employed, uh, just because, you know, um, of biology in a way, um, I often say. So that's that's just reality. And whilst it is fantastic that we, that it is, you know, there's so much conversation about it, we are working towards to address, you know, some longstanding issues in the space. One thing that women can do to address the, you know, imbalance in regards to their finances is to create some financial independence and some financial wealth of their own. God, there's so much in there, Veronica. I've made about 13 points just out of that one <laughs> that one monologue, and I don't even know where to start. Um, but it, I think the thing that's really interesting that you bring up is, um, and I've heard you speak uh, previously as well, is the biological difference. And there, there's no denying that there is a biological difference. And and I remember when I met my now ex-husband and, and I spoke about, look, I, I have this career trajectory. I really want to stay in the workforce. I don't want to be the one that stays at home with the children. You know, are you prepared to be a stay-at-home dad? And it was all yes, yes, yes. But the fact was when it came to it, you can't just, most women can't just have a baby and go back to work. It just doesn't, you know, there are things that happen to you emotionally, physically, um, these things do change for you after you've had that child. And sometimes they're not what you planned for. And if you haven't sort of got yourself sort of sorted out and, and, and on some sort of pathway before then, what you think you might be able to do afterwards can really, really change. I think that's an important thing to sort of point out is that I don't, when it comes to that biology, well, that's not, that's not for changing. And, um, you know, and plenty of women, yourself included, who thought that they might go back to work quite quickly after having children and then decided that they didn't, they chose that they didn't want to. And that is totally, of course, a hundred percent fine, right? And that is always going to be the way, probably speaking, right? But with that comes, you know, issues with finances further down the road. Um, and certainly in the respect of people that end up being separated, divorced or widowed, maybe not widowed as much, but certainly separated and divorced, if you have taken ch time out of the workforce, then financially you're probably going to be on the back foot um, for the, you know, potentially for the rest of your working life. Yeah. And, and then that follows into, into superannuation as well. So there's a knock-on effect, um, which we'll get to, but I, but I think maybe if we sort of wind back a little bit, because we've still got this issue, you know, for, forget gender just for a minute, we've got an issue in our schools with a very a lack of financial literacy being taught, a lack of these life skills effectively. Um, but then I suspect, and it feels to me like potentially there's still a bit of a gender imbalance around perceptions of who needs to learn about financial literacy. You know, I've heard some, I've heard some people interview you and I've been a little bit surprised actually to hear almost like, oh, aren't I, uh, you know, why aren't we getting through to women? Aren't we explaining things properly for them? You know, this sort of, ah, oh, yucky, creepy sort of bias that, that comes into the mindset of some people who perhaps um, haven't had to pay attention to whether or not it's just expected that men or boys will learn this stuff and women and girls won't. You know, as opposed to, can we learn it? Of course we can learn it. You know, we're three intelligent women. We've all mastered the financial aspects of it as well as the behavioural ones and the emotional ones too, which is very important. Of course we can learn it, but I do think that there is still that, it seems to be that there's still that sort of um, underground expectation. Even my daughter who is 16, she still talks about marrying someone who will provide for her. Now, honest to God, with the role model she with, has. With, with the mother that she's got, exactly. that's her approach to wealth creation. I cannot oh, believe come it. On. I'm horrified. <laughs> but, there, you know, these kids are still, in some regards, 
it's still there. You know, where do you think it's coming from? So that's I know we're going a bit off topic here, but I'm I'm curious. Is, is that a social media thing? Are they seeing that? You know, because I, I I still see it sometimes in um, stereotypes in yeah you know, movies in on on um, TV shows, certainly sometimes on TikTok, um, and, and sometimes I have to even pull my own boys up. My boys are only ten and twelve, but I might hear something in the background and go, "Ooh." Let's talk about that because that's not necessarily how things are going to work in your life um, and about even educating the boys to have um, a, a balanced and, and an equal and a discussion about gender equality the other day. And I really thought that this was something that was um, talked about quite well at school. It's not really. Not even in high school is it really talked about. You didn't about. have to worry about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, And I think as well, we're talking about stereotypes which exist, it continue to exist. And, and so someone like myself, you know, I, um, I'm a journalist, I've got a master's in creative writing, I've dabbled in screenwriting, um, you know, studied a lot um, of filmmaking. Um, and realistically, it probably was only about 10 years ago or thereabouts where we started to see more female-led narratives in filmmaking. You know, I certainly, in the years gone by, well before Me Too, would actually, um, I've walked out of films uh, where there has been such a ridiculous minority of female representation. Um, I follow a, a lot of research in this space about, you know, the roles that women are portrayed to have within films. They're often, you know, the mother, the wife, you know, in regards to the research which shows, you know, the speaking parts and look, I don't know if this is a number, but, you know, say like 25% of, of the speaking parts in films generally have been for women and the rest have been for men. And sometimes those speaking parts were revolving. The only thing that women were talking about were men. Yeah, I was about to say that. It's like yeah. they're speaking <laughs> over, what are they talking about? Isn't yeah. that called the Beckdale scale? I actually, you know what, I got the pip the other day because I started watching a new show that's come out called Daisy and the Six. And Daisy Jones and the Six, and it's about a 1970s um, uh, a band. And I started watching it, and like I got through, there's only three episodes available, but as I was watching it, I'm like going, okay, so the, the show is called Daisy Jones, Woman, Woman, and the Six, but realistically, and I, I, if I had the time, you know, I would like go back and go, how much actually of the first three episodes was actually about Daisy, and how much of it was about this bloke that clearly she hooks up with, and they join their bands together, and I think that the majority actually would have been his story in the first three episodes. Um, so I don't know if I'll watch any more of that one, regardless of the fact that Daisy Jones is paid by Elvis Presley's granddaughter. Um, so there's things like that, the prevailing stereotypes, you know, of narratives um, that are whether they are in social media, they're in filmmaking, um, they're in obviously in TV. And I guess even if we do have children that are 16 and things like that, it really has only been in most recent history where that is changing. Um, and part of that was because of Me Too, obviously. But I guess the, I guess the big changer in regards to films was Bridesmaids, um, where it was, you know, a female film for females with female characters and a female narrative, whatever that might be. And it did really, really well. And Hollywood went, oh, okay, maybe we can make some money here. And now, obviously, we do see a huge number of films with females as the core characters. Sometimes they're just sort of trying to, I think personally, trying to have male characters, but just with the female playing that role and calling it a female narrative. But anyway, that's my personal that's my personal <laughs> opinion. But there's all of these types of things, I think, unfortunately, that have been prevailing, obviously, you know, as Gen X is throughout our lives and also encroaching into the lives of our children as well. Mm. And and we are look. We, this is a a first time by a podcast, so we do we we we, we, we will come back on topic. But do that. <laughs> yeah, you got three strong women here, and I I do want to touch on some of um what you do in the property industry, Nicola, because you're you're not just a writer. Um, the female investor is not your only book. You you also have property investing for dummies. I think the updated version was was one that you have co-written. And you are the current chair of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia. So we're talking here with a woman who has not only um, grown her own financial security through property and, and decisions and, and risk, taking risk, because there's always risk involved in doing these things, educated yourself, but you're now working to, to help other people to make sure that when they are getting advice from other people, that those people have some level of a credibility 
um, and some level of education because this industry that we're in is unregulated. You can call yourself an advisor, a buyer's agent, you only need a license in your state to be able to call yourself a buyer's agent and no experience, which just absolutely riles me. Um, but but you're, you're a part of a massive movement of people, including Veronica and I, who are pushing for accreditation within the, um, the property advice area because we don't want anyone, but particularly women, to go down the path of thinking, I need someone else to help me do this because I haven't done it before, whether that's, you know, you're young and you're looking for some help along the way, or you've suddenly found yourself single at a point in life where you you want to put yourself together and, and really get yourself on the pathway. So tell us a little bit about Pippa and and what your role is and, and a little bit about your background, because I think your story is just fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. Obviously, I've known you for a long time too. Yes, so, um, yes we have uh, known each other a very, very long time. Long time. Um, <laughs> well, you've been in the industry, what, nearly 20? 20... 17 years this year. 17 years? Mm, yep. Yeah, 20, yep. 2006 I started uh, with the REOQ. That's um, right. Yeah, and ended up obviously the head of corporate affairs um, and the media manager there for many years. Uh, left there because I was offered the role as the editor of Australian Property Investor magazine. So I, I back when was it was the, printed? Yes, and went back when it was printed and successful. Um, it was the number one magazine for nearly 20 years. Um then I stayed there for two years. My mother was quite unwell with Alzheimer's at that point, um, and my family was struggling to look after her, so I decided to uh, leave and uh, just freelance for a while so I could help my family. Um, as it turned out, um, <laughs> my mum went into respite care and um, decided to scale a fence to get out of respite care, and, and it wasn't, it's not funny at all, but she broke her leg. Um, quite badly, and she she always she never actually came home again because she went into full time care from that moment. So I kind of and literally that was within about a month of me resigning from the magazine, thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to be at mum's this many days a week and things, and and um, unfortunately she she never came home again, and she died a couple of years ago from Alzheimer's. So from that moment on, I I found myself you know with quite a profile. I was already on the Pippa board by that stage. Uh, ben Kingsley had asked me to nominate in 2014, um, and I'll just um, say that all of the Pepper board members are volunteers. Um, we so I've been on the board since 2014. So yeah, so I freelanced for a couple of years and, and found myself really, really, really busy over time. Organically, it became apparent that you know my niche within a niche was working with people on the buying side of the transaction um, in regards to you know um, public relations. Uh, media engagement and things. And then my dear friend, Kieran Clear, who I'd met at the um, API magazine, he was working at the Courier Mail and I took him out for lunch and convinced him to go into business with me. So, um, <laughs> And thus we, Bricks and Mortar was and born. And thus Bricks and Mortar was born. And, just and showing, was, I, I have the background here just in support of that business, <laughs> oh. which is a fabulous <laughs> public relations Yeah, business. so we, we, we've been at the yeah, BMM, this is our sixth year this year. You know, uh, we're a small bespoke national public relations firm. Um and then from there, last year, a year ago, just just over a year ago, I was elected unopposed as the Pippa Chair, following on from the wonderful Peter Kalisos, um, and um, been pretty busy 12 months in the space. Clearly, we were a part of the campaign against the Queensland land tax last year, um, which was probably, you know, the best professional day of my life. It was such a, such a well-run campaign, just for those who don't remember our stomachs all dropped the day that we realised that Queensland was going to enforce something that had such a detrimental, was going to have such a detrimental effect on property investors and owners in Queensland and in other states. And uh, and it was going, it was there, it was happening and it had been snuck through under the radar. And uh, it, you, together with um, Antonio Mercarella, who's the CEO of the REIQ, were instrumental to strong, really great female real estate minds, really galvanised and put together an, an incredibly good campaign that stopped that in its tracks. Oh, Antonia, and you congratulations know. Congratulations to you on that. Thank you, Antonia. You know, a great friend of mine, former colleague at the REIQ, former housemate as well, a lot of people oh, don't she- realise. <laughs> um, Antonia and I are like best mates, pretty much. We're actually going away on holiday together in a few weeks. 
Um, but um, so that's quite interesting that she's the head of the REIQ now, and I'm the head of Pippa. And when we met, you know, we weren't uh, leaders in the in the you know organisation that we worked for. But anyway, I kind of like that story. It's wonderful. Not many people know that. So there you go. Um, but they were they were on the front foot the whole time. And I guess with, with us with Pippa, we we sat back, same as you, and kind of went when it was first announced, went that's not going to happen. And we did a little bit of campaigning, but not a lot, because I just thought there is just no way. And then I was actually away in New Zealand and my visiting my dad and my phone just blew up, which was when that passed it, you know. And then thankfully, we always do our annual Pippa, um, annual investor sentiment survey in August every year. And we had the opportunity to ask some questions, which the answers, I was the first one to see those answers um, and I knew what we had in front of us. And when we, we spent a lot of time working on the analysis got independent expert analysis, uh, put it out to the uh, media, uh, and it was repealed eight days later. And let's just see how important that actually was because the potential effect, we're in a rental crisis like right now where there is not enough supply for the amount of people who need a home. And had that gone ahead, tell me, um, Nicola, the percentage of people who planned to sell their investment property was... I think because the data, obviously, we looked at the investors who had already sold in the last two years, and of those investors, 45% had already sold at least one property in Queensland. In the two years prior to the legislation, well, the legislation, I think, was announced. It wasn't passed. And then we did some more research, and you're making me think now because it was several months ago, about 30%. Yeah, hundreds of thousands of, of properties were already stripped from the Queensland market. And then we had asked investors what their what their selling intentions were going forward, and again it would have stripped another hundred two hundred thousand properties from the market nationally. Um, and the number one reason why investors, when we asked them in the survey, which was August last year, a month after a month or two after the legislation came in, what is your what are the reasons why you're going to sell in sell in Queensland? And number one was that tax. And um, so we knew, like, and it was interesting that. There was a lot of people saying, oh, why have we got this rental crisis? What's happening? What's this? What that? But when we actually did that research, um, I can't remember who it was. It might have been Pete Wargent or someone like that just sort of said some really, emailed me and said something really nice along the lines of, this is the first time that anyone's actually sort of explained what the heck's going on with their rental market. Because what in the research it showed, yes, a huge volume of people, of investors had sold in Queensland. To, to make the most of rising market because it had been pretty crap for a long time. Um, but not only that, that sold to other owner, that sold to owner occupiers, not to investors. So that had, that had stripped those properties from the market. So as I say, when we actually saw those results, I was like, here we go. Indicated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And had we lost that, then it would have been a, a heck of a lot worse than we're even seeing now. And from that moment on, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. I did the, the lending indicators came out on Friday. Um, you know, and then the number of investors who who, who have um, purchased a who purchased a property in January uh, was the lowest, or well, the, there was the same as it was in August 2020, which was when we were in the middle of lockdowns, and everyone thought that you know property prices were going to fall. Um, so unfortunately, when it comes to the rental undersupply, that is going to get worse than we where we are now, which is a horrible, horrific thing to think They're about. They're more expensive, and Veronica, that you know that then has the flow-on effect, as you mentioned earlier. You know, women are becoming the largest cohort of of homelessness across the country. Well, yes, because also the most vulnerable in our society are those that are first becoming homeless. So, so we already have a cohort that's homeless, and then you've got people who are being displaced. Um, as rents rise and as properties, well, the properties come out of the, the marketplace and rents rise and there's a combination of factors there. And a lot of people are quick to run around saying that this is because of interest rates rising, but it is absolutely not. Um, I did a rant video on that a, a while ago, it, actually in response to some of your research in Pippa, um, Nicola, because if it was that easy, I would have raised my rents. <laughs> every time I felt like it, if it, literally, if you could just do it that easily, you just, oh, I just feel like I need a bit extra cash. I just think I'll put my rent up and you can't do that. There are market forces. But the problem with that and going back to women being a very vulnerable cohort in our society or single women at this, at this point, if we're talking about single women over 55 being very vulnerable, that's not good. You know, like having a rental crisis is bad enough, but 
once again, it, it comes back to a vulnerable sector of our society. And so we wind back and say, right, well, how can those, how could those women have prevented that? Because these aren't all people that don't have jobs. A lot of these people that are homeless actually have had, they've had something happen. They might have become sick or they might have lost their job for whatever reason, need to get a new one. Um, it's not like they're totally, you know, these people aren't on social benefits. A lot of these people, they actually are gainfully employed, but they've had something, a bit of a financial shock. So this is, this is one reason why we want to talk to you a bit of a, a big, long segue away from the topic and then back to it, because the idea about women setting up ourselves up better at a younger age, I think is so important. But how do we do that when we think, oh, but I want to travel. Oh, but I want to, you know, I want to experience, so I don't want to be tied down with a mortgage at a young age. What are the, some of the solutions you're proposing in, your, in this book, Nicola? I think as well, you know, um, at the moment, the issue as well that I often think about, um, given my, my recent circumstances, is that, um, say, if you're married and you want to separate, where, you know, where are these people, whether they're male or female, going to go if they only own the one property together or if they rent together um, because, the pay, you know, they may not be able to uh, afford to, to actually leave. And then it'll be like War of the Roses, you know, that, that show, that the film from years ago. There's actually, and people might be staying in bad situations because they literally have nowhere to go. Um, which is my sort of, you know, I'm worried the most about at the moment because we have got that rising number of separations and divorce post-COVID. Um, some solutions, clearly, you know, and the book is quite different, I guess, in regards to many of the other books out there. One, it's written by women for women. Um, I think when we were talking in the beginning about, you know, young people um, still not getting the message, perhaps, well, that's because often the message is still coming from men. Um, and so, you know, I think it's vitally important, like you, you two are doing, like I'm doing, you know, you can't be what you can't see, especially on International Women's Day. Um, but also, you know, the messaging from women to other women is very different than it would be from a man. So the more that we can... Um, create content that is specific for women, um, targeted to women, written by women who have been there and done that, I think that that will improve the financial literacy of women of all ages, um, including 16-year-olds, you know. Um, so I think that's vitally important. And, and I guess with the female investor, it's an overview of everything that women need to start to understand. We don't push a particular strategy. We explain to them all the different strategies. We empower them to become informed and make up their own minds about what strategy is the right, right one for them. And we also say that realistically, if you were to purchase one property, and it could be an investment property when you're younger, while you continue to rent as a rent investor, could be interstate, you know, working with the experts and things like that, even if you just buy one property um, that you hold throughout the decades independently, so you own it yourself, and even if you partner up, that property is doesn't get put in the pool, maybe you get a financial binding agreement or whatever needs to be done, that can you know, greatly improve your financial outcomes. And most importantly, if the relationship comes to an end, it actually gives you somewhere to go. Um, and it gives you clarity before there's emotion. Yeah. And, and, and at the moment, that is not the situation. And I, I, I preference that because I, my husband and I made the decision to separate a couple of months ago and it's all very amicable. You know, we had a wonderful relationship, came to the, we came to the end of the road. Um, we're still great friends. Um, I've taken on advice from, from certain people, maybe someone who's involved in this podcast, um, from friend to friend, but you know what the beauty of, beauty of it is, is that, um, we have the opportunity to be pragmatic and smart about the, the property that we do own together because I had other properties outside of the marriage of which one I've shifted into. And we've actually had the opportunity to sit down and we don't have to do a fire sale because it's not like we've just got one asset together and neither of us can move on without us selling that asset. And so we have come to an agreement um, about what's the smartest play that we can do regarding regarding that property. I, I admittedly, a lot of people, you know, it, their, their break, marriage breakdowns or whatever are not as good as that. But I guess in regards to it, just allowed us more opportunities than most people would have because 
you know, the marriage ended and I moved back to another property that I had owned previously to the marriage. Um, and then it's given us time to uh, think about what we might want to do with the property um, and keeping in mind that, you know, maybe the market conditions aren't great to sell at the moment because we actually don't need to sell. And it was funny, I was just saying to someone the other day, you know, when I wrote The Female Investor, I wouldn't, that was the, that was the, you know, what I would, what I talked about in the book. And um, I'm actually living and breathing actually the outcome now. It's almost like you wrote your, wrote your own playbook. <laughs> Look, and no one goes into a relationship expecting it to end. That's, that's certainly not um, what having that financial um, security is, is about. But I now am in a relationship um, and we both have bought our own assets and our own money and our, you know, so forth. And, and we sat down and we had a very pragmatic conversation about, yep, we're entering into this now. It may come to an end. If it does, how are we going to deal with that before we become emotional about the conversation? And, and I think that's one of the things that I, I really like about what you've written about here is yeah, there is a desire to pool everything and to to do things together when you're in love and and you feel like the 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 future there is no end to your future together. But if you kind of think about it as what what could happen if this happens, um, then you 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 are setting yourself up for a little bit more security in the the worst case scenario of you becoming single again and and having to um, continue your life rather than building from zero and and not knowing what you've got to work with. I'm sort of in the back of my mind, I've got the voice of the listener saying, yeah, but you know, I, we can't, I can't afford my own property yet, or I'm not sure I can afford to buy a property on my own, you know? So we recognize that that is a challenge. We do recognize that. And I think what Nicola was saying earlier then about the, you know, the idea of even rent vesting before you're really ready to settle down or ready to couple up or whatever. I, I think it, it's more the mindset of it. It's the idea that, you know, if you are on a career trajectory, you do have good earnings. It's it's the starting good habits younger um, so that even if you do have a good life, you know, as in travel and socialize and lots of stuff, you don't want to be a hermit. You know, you've got to live now, but you've also got to be thinking, I need to look after myself. I have to tell you, I mean, you know, it's, we've all been through <laughs> breakdowns of relationships over the last, you know, so many years. And and certainly having that financial security as, as a woman and also bringing assets into the relationship as I did too, into my sort of, you know, longest relationship, you know, you do know, and you've got agreements and, and, and whatnot, but you do know that when you separate, there's, there are assets there to do things with. And like Nicola was saying, you've got also choice in terms of your timing. And, and so this is what's so wonderful. This is one of the reasons we bang on about the asset quality that you buy. You know, that's really important. What you buy, particularly for first time buyers, is so important because it's that growing inequity that gives you, that means where the value of the property grows, that gives you that freedom. You know, the longer you're in it, the longer you own that property, if it's a good asset, it goes up compounding. It's a, what is it? The eighth wonder of the world or something? It's a um, beautiful concept. Ah, I love it. And you know what? It's funny because we talk about financial literacy and I remember struggling with statistics at university and my mind loves statistics now. I sat down with my daughter last night, helping her with her maths homework and I was actually on property statistics. I was like beside myself. Oh, um, what a great practical application. Because I remember someone saying to me, I learned about compound interest at school, but I had no idea it actually applied me to too. property. I think I might have failed mathematics statistics, actually, which is hilarious now because that's all that I do. <laughs> hey, can I just mention something, actually, just on what you were saying, Veronica? I was um, coming back from a, I'm involved in a sport and I carpool with another lady and we were coming home last night. And we would, you know, the conversation got onto property and she told me, which I love this story and it's so wonderful that I've talked to you both today. Her daughter is a 24-year-old nurse, uh, had got a new position in a major regional location, um, has a boyfriend from a few years. Uh, he's decided to become an apprentice. Um, she was really, really keen uh, to purchase, he wasn't, so she just went ahead and did it. And he, they live together, and she, he pays her rent uh, aboard. Um, and I just said to my friend last night, I said I love that story because she didn't let the fact that her partner wasn't ready or didn't have the finances, and she, and she's a nurse, 
And she managed to buy in a regional location, major regional location where the price points are lower. And the I think it was in the 300s or something, but still, you know, a reasonable price for where she lives. And, and I guess her salary is a, as a relatively young nurse. But she pushed on and she did that in her own name. And that uh, he, he pays That's her fantastic. board. And because and I've heard so many times in the past, oh, yeah, well, we were, you know, I was going to do that, but I met so and so and they didn't. And it could be from both genders. But I think it's about having that single-minded mindset that men have and that we actually do have if we turn it on to say, you know what, and of some of the, I think I said it before we went on air, unfortunately, this is the, I've done so many podcasts, uh, recordings, this is the first time I've been interviewed by women, so we need more of these, um, not necessarily in competition with you lovely ladies, but we need more female voices more female authority, more female stories, all of these nature, you know, all of this nature. So I just wanted to sort of mention that, that we, you know, we need to hear from women more if we are going to change the narrative. Because, oh, that's what I was going to say. One of the podcasts I had along last year, God, this pisses me off. I hope I'm allowed to say that. Um, <laughs> the whole man, the man is not a plan narrative. Yeah, yeah. A man is not a financial plan. Lordy. And I think, I mean, I think that's a prevailing stereotype that's out there. And um, I certainly, as a Generation X, that's never been part of my narrative. But then again, my childhood was probably slightly different than, than most and that I'm, a, you know, the, the, the daughter of a, you know, a grandfather, the granddaughter of a grandfather who was a property owner and a small business owner. And my dad, same property owner, the small business owner, I'm the same. Um, and I've talked many times before on the record about learning at the kitchen table um but you know I, I don't think our generation we've always wanted to create our own financial futures but I think perhaps is what miss what's missing is you know female voices female experience female content by females for females um and the more that we can do of that the more I think that women are going to recognize the stories that they hear um, and be able to forge their own paths. Well, we're singing from the same hymn book on that one. And it is interesting because I look back at, you know, why did I, I was so driven to succeed, you know, before I even knew what success, success looked like, you know, and part of that was just because I came, I was brought up in a very, you know, very middle-class area, but we weren't middle-class. Like my dad, we were really working class. And so I guess in a way I looked around, I was like, I want more. I want an easier life. You know, I, I think I, I'm not to say that my, my dad, my mum didn't work much. She worked at, at, at a couple of times, but so it was not that my dad didn't work hard. It's just that he didn't have the, the resources available to him that I have had because, you know, I've been able to go to university and I've also been able to um, learn and apply what I've learned. And also I got into property at a young age. I was in my late twenties and I also got into the property industry. And that's really when I started properly learning about property. So a lot of people think that they bought their first property and they sort of, well, a lot of people look to other people who bought their first property and think, oh, they know what they're doing. And I sure as hell didn't. And it honestly, even people in the property game often don't know what they're doing because they don't apply critical thinking. They haven't sort of looked around them and went, oh, hang on a minute. Not every property does go up at the same rate or, you know, <laughs> a rising tide does not lift all shifts. Um, that sort of thing. And so I, I, it is amazing. I think there's an individual drive because I still look around this, you know, the very fact that, that our largest growing cohort of homelessness is I'm not quite that age yet, but I'm not far off it, you know? So I'm obviously not speaking on behalf of the majority of the people that are my age. So we have a problem still. And if, if we're, that's not trickling down to our, our kids these days because of social media and all the rest of it then, you know, we do have to speak up and loud. And and you mentioned there, and I want to pick up, Veronica, is that education piece. You and and Nicola had the opportunity, and I, to a degree, had the opportunity to to listen to parents who had in some way um, sought to educate themselves to, you know, around how do I build a financial future for myself? Or if that wasn't there, had the drive and the ambition to go, I don't know what I don't know. Who are the people around me who I can start learning from, and and what can I take from that? So there wasn't there wasn't any of this sort of information around that was independent, reliable, came from experts who haven't got an agenda 
who aren't trying to sell you anything. There wasn't anything like that back then. And which I bought my first property in 1998. The internet really wasn't up and running. There wasn't a lot of information, but God, there was a lot of spruikers out there at the time. And had I gone down the path of going to, I did go to a lot of seminars, to be honest. I did want to learn, but I didn't, I knew that what they were selling wasn't what I wanted to buy. Um, and it just didn't make sense to me. These people who, who um, were, were trying to push an agenda uh, with the with the guise of of education and and I think you know there there are so many places that people can get information these days and and I just I urge people to make sure that when you are looking at reading listening to um podcasts wherever it is that you have a look at what is behind what is driving the person who is imparting that information and what are they trying to achieve by giving it to you? Because if it's not independent, if it's not selling anything else, it's not in your interest, then turn your back and walk away. You know, get a book like Nicola's that is going to give you all of the options, not say you should do this because everybody is successful if they do this. There are so many different options and we all have different risk profiles. And, and us three women sitting here, we have a high tolerance for risk. We're prepared to take risk. That is not the risk profile of everybody. And, you know, often people couple up who one's, one's a spender and one's a saver, one takes risks, one doesn't. Um, but if you're doing it on your own, you've got to understand your risk profile a little bit to be able to say, well, how, much can, how much am I prepared to put on the line and how comfortable do I feel? Because okay. not everyone feels comfortable taking on risk either. And I think that's important. You make valid points. And obviously over recent weeks, uh, Pippa and Reba as well have, um, you know, <laughs> this wasn't coordinated in any way, but uh, I got a bit of a campaign um, issuing a warning to consumers to ensure that they check the credentials of any advisor that they're considering working with uh, because we have seen a rise of spruikers like, you know, they've been around forever, but the internet, social media gives a platform to everybody uh, and a lot of those people don't deserve that platform and don't have the skills, the experience, the qualifications to back up what they're saying. They're good um, marketers. Yeah, that, that's right. And I actually, it was a good interview that um, I did with News Corp um, and they kind of asked me about, you know, um, fin influencers or however, whatever the actual term is. Influencers. Fin influencers, which is very mm. hard, very hard to say out loud. Um, but, you know, and I sort of mentioned while I'm, I'm not an expert in that space, um, these people are often literally paid to promote a product. Uh, that's how they, you know, that's how they make their money. But they've got hundreds of thousands of followers and, and people think they're the best thing since sliced bread. Um, so... You know, because we... they look successful, don't they? Oh, do they do. You know, smoke and mirrors, man, smoke and mirrors. Yeah. And um, so it's just vital that anyone, whether you're buying your first property, you know, your first investment, uh, you're upgrading, perhaps you're perhaps you're newly single or whatever, there are plenty of bona fide experts out there, such as you two, that have the skills, that have the experience, that have the qualifications, that you know, produce content that's valuable and informative and educational. And I think it's important, like you said as as well, Megan, that it's yeah, the very best operators should be talking generally about the concepts. Um, there is no one size fits all when it comes to property investment advice. It needs to be, you know, it, b b it needs to be bespoke and tailored to you individually as a person because of your risk profile, your income level, your goals. You've got to understand you know, yourself, haven't you? All of these things. So. Uh, that is the number one thing that I'm trying to, uh, I guess, change is for people to, um, and, and with my role as Pippa and obviously with my other hats that I wear, is to get women to feel like they're educated enough or to educate themselves enough so that they are, they can make informed decisions themselves um, and, and not be led down the garden path by someone whose only interest is lining their own pockets with your money. Yes, uh, there's... Um... Shout out from the rooftops. And <laughs> ad I saw very recently that says, learn investing with other people's money. Oh, and my God. Yes. And it's just horrendous. And the problem is it's not only what? men. I know <laughs> that there are more ma male players in this space like than female. So you can't <laughs> just sort of having trouble getting up off the yeah, floor. You can't yeah. just assume. Well, we normally say o OPM is meaning the bank's money, right? But I've never heard. No, other people's with your client's money. And so this is this is worn like a badge of honor. Like that's a really smart thing to do. And so you don't want to be that client, you know. 
And so, as I said, it's, you know, there are, there are more men in this space than women. So obviously proportionately, there's going to be more chance of a spruker being a male than a woman, but it, that's not, that's not the litmus test. That's not the, the, the way to, to determine it. That doesn't mean that all males are spruikers either. No, it doesn't. No, 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 no. And I'm no, sure there's probably some female ones out there too. That's the point. That's exactly it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 100 And I think as well, you know, while I've been banging on, you know, about um, uh, female voices and, you know, female experts and female leaders, and that is vitally important. Um, and, you know, I think the number one takeaway when I talk about these things is that women just make sure they're following bona fide experts Yes. Um, of any gender um, that have the runs on the board, the experience, especially the qualifications, the industry associations who are happy to let you speak to their clients if you so wish or whatever, make sure that the person that you're following and certainly the person that you're, you know, that you are maybe choosing to work with knows what they're talking about. That's the kind of my really simple message that I say quite often is that make sure they actually know what they're talking about. Um, Because if you do that, you're going to save yourself a heck of a lot of money and heartache and maybe, you know, prevent financial ruin in the future. And of course, the way to do that is to give yourself enough education so that you can, your antenna will go off and listen to your instinct. If it doesn't sound right, there's a good chance it isn't right. Um, And so, and I think that's another thing that's quite difficult because like Megan said earlier, a lot of the people that are in this space are they're snake oil, snake oil salespeople, right? They're very good at selling the message and often make it sound so simple. Yes. They often make it sound so simple. Yes. This is the secret. I can't believe nobody else is telling you this. This is my, the way that I've made all my fortune, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, how long have you been doing this for? And, you know, and so if it's a very short period of time and they're talking about future you know, if they're talking about short-term gains, they're talking about projected future gains, and they haven't actually lived through that future yet, so they don't have the evidence, then, you know, if your antenna's going off, just remember, listen to your instincts. And just because one person made that $200,000 profit on that quick slip. No, I know. Being, you know, pushed <laughs> out there of, of, of uh, you know, buy, flip, make this much money, maybe one or two people might have done that if they were lucky. They got lucky, but how many people have paid for that course or paid for that information or paid for that advice who didn't? Yeah. And that is just as important as the people who did succeed is how many haven't, how many have done this, but actually haven't had that outcome? Problem is though, the, the whole, the whole concept of making money through real estate slowly is like I so often say that, you know. So boring. That get rich slowly. So well, it's boring. not that sexy, but yeah. it's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> well, not even get rich, you know, improve your financial future over the Slowly. decades. But that's not going to, that's, that's not a spruik of line, is it? Courses, is it? <laughs> but it? But it actually is the truth, right? It, it is. is the truth. And that's how people make money in property. And most people, and, but most people, unfortunately, want the get rich quick schemes because um, that is human nature or can be. And they um, are attracted by all of the, you know, marketing bells and whistles that are designed to emotionally engage them. Um, and um, everything that, you know, you two are doing that I'm doing, informing the public um, and especially women, hopefully will allow them to be able to see through all of that. Yes. I guarantee you, and I've been in the industry for 21 years, and I guarantee you that every time a new scheme comes out, this is new, it's never been done before, I guarantee you I've seen it. Same oh, shit, yeah. different shovel. Yep. That's all that is. Here we go again. Yeah, and even when it's about market cycles or interest rate settings or economic shocks or all of these things, I was saying to someone yesterday, you know, after seven or ten years, not quite as long as you, Megan, but, um, you know, none of it's new. Um, and I, and Here we go says, again. When, when this too shall pass. Yeah, yeah, that's right. When I did the new edition of Property Investing for Dummies, that was 10 years old. And um, it was quite interesting, you know, during the new edition that I'd forgotten about some of the stuff that happened back then, but how much of it was just like, oh, change out GFC to pandemic, <laughs> you know, and yes. interest rate and things like this. And, you know, the, 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 I think the, the average, the median house price in the book from 2012 was 400. Um, it was actually a really good walk down memory lane. Oh, how interesting. It was likewise, likewise, and this too will pass. You know, those of us who've been in the, in the game for a long time, pretty much seen it all. Um, it takes a lot to impress me. Like if someone came along with something entirely new, I'd be 
begrudging, like, oh, well, at least you got, you know, 10 points for creativity there, mate, or whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, unfortunately, you know, it, it, it successful real estate investing, investing should be, doesn't need to be stressful and it can be simple. Um, and, that, but, but the way that you can make that, you make that your story is ensuring that you are, you know, educating yourself and, and working with, with experts where appropriate. Hundred percent. Thank you so much for coming along, Nicola. It's been such a great chat. We've covered so much ground. <laughs> we do have a question, Veronica. Oh, we do. Oh, We're yes, sorry, we Al. always have a question. The question, <laughs> Megan has not forgotten the question. Well done. Okay, I'm ready, Nicola. What is the one thing you wish you knew when you were a first home buyer? Oh, no, we didn't prep her for this one. No, no she didn't prep for any quite of that. Happy with my first purchase. <laughs> well, that's um, unusual. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was well actually because I bought. I was I was at the. I was already working at the REIQ, and I have often said I knew a lot about real estate. I knew a lot about how real estate, but it's not about property investing. And I remember um, wanting to buy at the start of two thousand and seven, um, and tapping into the brains of the likes of Dan Malloy and Peter McGrath, um, who were the CEO and chair at the time, uh, Pam Bennett even. Um, so I actually had access to experts. You know, and so they, I kind of would show them all these things. And, and so the first one that I bought, I guess I did use, you know, ex, I did have experts Independent there to help, to help guide me. And I remember when I bought it based on, you know, their advice and going up, you know, the strategy that I've always done since then was buy the best that I could for the, you know, for the budget that I had available, um, was in a suburb where I remember when I bought this property, it's middle ring Brisbane, people were like going, oh my God. You know, what are you doing going out there? You know, and um, that property was three fifty, and now you wouldn't be able to get a house for under one point two um, in there. So, as a first home buyer, I guess you know, for me, well, I'm glad that I had access to those experts. So it guesses the answer, which a lot of first yeah, I was working at the REIQ, right? Um, but like you, you've said, Megan, there wasn't a lot of other experts in the space. You were one of the first buyers agents active back in the day. Uh, obviously, now if we fast forward all of these years, there are a significant increase in in, 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 in actual experts out there that people can tap into. Yeah. Well, that, so that's what you wish you knew, how lucky you well, were. I kind of knew it. So I did, <laughs> How do I answer that and kind of go, well... I didn't know what I didn't know, but I had access to experts who did know and I trusted yeah. their advice and I yeah. followed their advice. So you actually sought to get educated via I people did. who knew what they were doing but weren't trying to push you in and a particular direction. And that property was the cornerstone of my portfolio. I borrowed against that twice. There you Fabulous. go. Well done. The workhorse. We call those the workhorses. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was the workhorse, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, now I'm going to say it again. Thank you so much, <laughs> Nicola. It's been great to have this conversation. Uh, and hopefully, listeners, you didn't get sort of too caught up in our industry chat in the middle of it all because there's lots of really good stuff in there and we hope that you really got a lot out of it. Thank you so much. And I I'm, I'm love I'm loved the fact that we were chatting today of all days, International Women's Day. In this episode, we've covered a very small part of our 10-step online course for first-time buyers. If you would like to learn more about the process and how to buy without making a mistake, then head over to our website, www.homebuyeracademy.com.au. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss an episode. And if you like what you've heard today, please give us an iTunes review. Five stars would be wonderful. It will help others find us as well. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this really useful. And if you have, please share the love with others who you know are in the same boat. We'll be back next week with some more priceless stuff.